Okay, for this video, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to all grab a pipe. Don't care what kind of pipe it is. It could be a metal pipe, PVC pipe, smoking pipe, I don't care. Just take a pipe and then firmly grasp it in your hands. Because today's video is going to be about Sabo's homeland, the Goa Kingdom. And yeah, I know, technically it's also Ace and Luffy's homeland as well. But Ace was born in the South Blues, so I don't think that really counts. Luffy was born in Fuchsia Village, which is located on the outskirts of the Goa Kingdom. But, you know, isn't that kind of like saying you're from New York City, but you were actually born in Jersey? I mean, technically, yes, but no, you aren't. That's why Sabo gets top billing. Geography is everything, including where you live, what you eat, and what you breathe. Intro. Okay, so actually, before we get into talking about geography, I want to have a little bit of a sidetrack. I know, I know. We'll get back to geography. I just, I, I'm just curious about something, and this is a good time to bring it up. Okay, so, does anybody else find it weird that Sabo, at age 22, right now in the story, badass commander-in-chief of the Revolutionary Army, is still using the exact same metal pipe he used when he was a little kid fighting in the Grey Terminal? I find that a little weird. It makes sense when you're a little kid, you know, you're scavenging around the Grey Terminal, you're gonna pick up whatever piece of scrap metal you can to fight, but the pipe he used back then looks exactly like the pipe he uses now. And that bugs me, because you'd think after a while he would like, man, I wanna upgrade my pipe. Like, I'm, I'm not even upset that he uses a pipe as a weapon. It's like, okay, he's a polearm fighter, he likes a long reach. I'm like, that's fine, you could hurt somebody with this, right? A metal pipe, fine, but I'm just saying, maybe like, Kuma or Ivankov or Dragon at some point was like, you know, Sabo, give me your pipe. I want to modify it. I'm going to turn it into like it can shoot. Like Lindbergh could get his hands on this and make it like a like a fire pipe. I mean, I guess he doesn't need that right now because he has fire powers. But I mean, like a rocket powered pipe or it like separates into like a chain and he could use like nunchucks or something or like a, a, like a club or like a scythe blade comes out of the end of it or something. Like the, you can modify the pipe, but Sabo's just like, nope, just I just like to use a regular metal pipe. You know, it's whatever. It's versatile. I'm like, okay, fine, whatever. So, um, yes, the Goa Kingdom is located in the East Blue on Dawn Island, um, which is the place where Luffy began his pirate adventure. Makes sense because it's Dawn Island, the dawn of a new day. It's also located in the East and the sun rises in the East, so that's probably why it's called Dawn Island. It also sounds very similar to, like, a town in, like, a Pokemon game, you know? Like, you got Pallet Town because all the different cities in Kanto, they all have different colors, and so Pallets is, like, where the colors come come from, New Bark Town, because there's plants and trees, that's all the basis for the towns in Johto, Dawn Town, and then it's different regions like, like Twilight Burg, or, you know, it, it sounds appropriate, it's the beginning of an adventure, alright, so Dawn Island, and also coincidentally, Luffy is from Fuchsia Village, which there's Fuchsia City in Pokemon, or wait, is he from Fuchsia Village? No, he isn't, this is a mistake even I've made before, so I have to apologize, the name of Luffy's home village is not Fuchsia, it sounds very similar to fuchsia, but it's not fuchsia the color. It's fuchsia. And fuchsia in Japanese is windmill. And there's a bunch of those all around the village, so it's very abundantly clear. I think that's what Oda was going for here. And also, he doesn't live in Fuchsia because there's less ninjas. I didn't see a single ninja walking around the village when Luffy was a little kid. All right, so, yeah. And there was also no safari. Well, actually, you know what? There is kind of a safari zone. Yeah, Mount Kolbo is kind of a safari zone. They did have to deal with those giant tigers and stuff, so it's like halfway there. You get more ninjas, maybe. But, yeah, no, it's, it's Fuchsia Village or if it's too hard to, you know, say, you know, Fuchsia instead of Fuchsia, just call it Windmill Village. That's the easier way of saying it, right? So, um, the, let, let's just start there. Let's go through this canonically, okay? Because first chapter of One Piece, you know, we have Fuchsia Village, and we have Luffy living there, and that's when, you know, Higama comes down from the mountains, and he attacks the bar, and then Shanks is there, and then the whole thing with Lord of the Coast happens. Higama kidnaps Luffy, Shanks saves him, and that sets Luffy on his path to become the king of all pirates, okay? That's great. Now, you know, this was a very standard place back then. I mean, this was kind of, it, it, it makes sense. Like, hey, look, a tiny little village out in the middle of nowhere where shonen protagonists begin their journey. Haven't seen that before ever, you know? Not only just in that, but like in video games, pretty much every D&D &D campaign. It's just like, tiny little village, nothing really important. That's where our hero comes from, you know? Right? So, um, yeah, I mean, it makes sense, right? And whatever. And we see Fuchsia Village throughout the story. Whenever Luffy's, get, you know, he gets a bounty raise 
or the Straw Hat Pirates become known to the world. You'll have a scene with Machino looking at it, and everybody in the village, they all know Luffy because they basically raised him. That's something, I mean, I'm not really going to bring out up here, but, like, it was confirmed Luffy was born in Fusha, but there's, like, a whole section of Luffy's, like, early childhood as well as his birth that we just don't know how that went. I'm guessing Dragon and Luffy's mom settled down at Fusha at one point and gave birth to him, but, and then Dragon went off back to be, you know, the commander of the Revolutionary Army. Maybe his mom stayed around for a little while, but then something happened to her, but he was born in the village. I'm pretty sure that's been confirmed, and then basically after that, I mean, Garp looked after him as much as he could, but Garp is a vice admiral. He couldn't, like, live there, so he would have to go do his uh, marine duties, so it was mostly the town that raised Luffy as kind of like an orphan, which is really sad, but the townsfolk all seem nice. You got Machino, of course, that runs the bar, Party's Bar. You also have Mayor... His name is Whoop Slap, but I always want to say Wood Slap because he's like a kind of a grumpy old mayor and he's always carrying around this cane. And he's just like, you get out of there, you kids, or I'm going to slap you with my wood. And so that's, uh, it's just funnier for me. So Mayor Wood Slap. Um, it's actually always funny because every time the Straw Hats give a bounty raise, we always cut back to Fusha or the rest of the towns to see how they react to it. And at Fusha, everybody's always happy for Luffy. I'm like, oh, way to go, Luffy. Can follow your dreams, whatever they are. Meanwhile, Mayor Wood Slap's off to the side and he's just like, what are you people to freaking happy and gallivanting around here about? One of the most notorious pirates in the entire world came from our village. Mm. Which is an understandable, like, really, it is an understandable thing. Man, I wonder if Bartolomeo, he's going to eventually arrive at, at Fusha Village and take pictures and everything. Just like, oh, this is where Luffy lived. This is where Luffy did. Woodslap is just like, you damn tourists. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, I mean, like, they would probably get a lot of unwanted attention when they find out Luffy comes from this place, right? Um, so aside from that, we know there's mountain bandits in the area because Higuma is a thing. You know, Higuma shows up in the first chapter of One Piece, right? And so there's a mountain called Mount, uh, it's Corvo or Colbo, and that's in the distance kind of behind the village. And every now and then mountain bandits will come down from there and they'll, you know, raid the villages. They'll burst in, steal some booze, you know, whatever berries they can and head back up to the mountains, right? It's kind of a problem, but, you know, it's kind of out in the country, not a big deal, really. Um, but then... <laughs> And I found this funny, by the way, when I found this out. I was sitting there like, Oda, are you serious? I wonder if Oda really did plan this from the very, very beginning, or if it's something he added in later. Because after Marineford, when we finally get the backstory of Luffy growing up at Infusha, alongside Ace, and then his previously unknown third brother, Sabo, um, you know, there's like 580-something chapters in the story, we finally get this. We get, the, we get the flashback, and Oda gives us a map of the Goa Kingdom, the previously unknown Goa kingdom that Fusha village just happens to be part of. So it's like, oh yeah, see, there's this tiny little village, just a sleepy little hamlet on the side of Dawn Island at the coast, you know, just gentle windmills passing in the breeze, and then just gonna zoom out a little bit here at the giant kingdom that's sitting like a few miles to the right. It's just like, really? <laughs> I'm looking at that map, and I'm like, really? That's how it always looked ever since chapter one. You had that planned, Oda? I don't know. I'm thinking maybe Oda was sitting there, and he's like, well, I want to have this whole backstory with Luffy and Sabo and everything and Ace, but I, I can't really do that if it's just, like, out in the boonies. Like, really, there's nothing around them. So I'm going to just have this giant city that always existed right over the mountains that no one ever mentioned or talked about. Okay, gotcha, buddy. That's like, I mean, I live pretty much out in the middle of nowhere. In fact, even close to where I live, there's a wind farm. So here's a bunch of pretty little windmills that are around where I live. Um, but yeah, there's like, I live out in the mountains of Appalachia, Western PA, kind of tiny little mountain village just tucked out in the middle of nowhere. But uh, you just uh, walk through those woods over there, about a mile or two, and you'll stumble upon Chicago. <laughs> you know, just like there's a giant metropolitan city, just like ah, just 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 a little bit over that hill there. You can't really you can't really see it from here, but it's there. So okay, fine. Now to be fair, it's not literally next door. It's not like Luffy could just you know Luffy go grab some eggs, and he just like walks like a mile, and he's already in the Goa Kingdom. No, so you got Fusha Village off to the side, kind of like nice little peaceful country. 
countryside. Then you got Mount Colbo, which is sort of like the divider. And there's like, a, it's, a, it's a mountain range. It's not just one mountain. It's like a mountain range that divides the Goa Kingdom proper from Fusha. Technically, yes, Fusha is part of the Goa Kingdom, but they don't care about it. It's a tiny little windmill village. They do not care about problem. And I'm sure they have to pay taxes and everything. But, you know, the nobility are so haughty and so, you know, prim and just be like, oh, we are so awesome living in Goa. You know, they don't care about the tiny little boondock village. All right, they don't. So then you got, you know, Mount Colbo Mountain Range. Then you got some place called the Midway Forest, which is a forest, you know, on the other side of the mountain, like coming down, sort of dividing even more so. And there's like crazy wild animals, like giant bears, giant tigers, and a bunch of other creatures that'll make you go, oh my, in this village. There's ravines. There's, it's, it's a very dangerous place. This was the place Luffy kept trying to chase Ace every day and Ace would uh, get a little further and then Luffy would eventually fall down in a pit or get attacked by a bear or something. But after weeks and months of finally following him, Luffy managed to finally follow Ace all the way to the end of the Midway Forest. Okay, so that's another divider. So that's pr probably another reason why people don't go to Fuchsia very often. I just did it. Fuchsia very often. Um, now, on the other side of the Midway Forest, this is where things get a little bit um, upsetting. This is One Piece we are talking about. And although this is not like as bad as Marie Joie, um, it is still a kingdom filled with nobility, and even though it is kind of tucked in the corner of the world, it's sort of like a thing where it's like, because because to the people at Marie Joie and to the Tenryu Bito, they view the Goa Kingdom as this just backwater, you know, tiny little town compared to Marie Joie, compared to all the major cities in the One Piece world, okay? So it is kind of funny, where the people in Goa, like Outlook the Third, who is Sabo's biological father, and his wife... Did it? Did it? Did, did it? Whatever. You know, they view themselves as so awesome because they're nobles living in Goa. It's like, oh yes, we are so better than the peasants living in the surrounding area. But then the Tenryubito show up and is like, no, you don't understand. You're all peasants. You live out here in the middle of nowhere. You know, so it's like, it's kind of like no matter what situation you're in, there's always people that like to view themselves as like better than everybody else, okay? So that that's how that goes, right? Um... So yeah, that, that's the Goa Kingdom proper, but there's another area that's in between Goa and the Midway Forest, and that is the Grey Terminal. The Grey Terminal is horrible. Like, in every single sense of the word is horrible. It looks horrible, it smells horrible, because it's basically just a giant junk heap. It's just a, it's a huge dump, essentially. And it's just, uh, just morally horrible, because basically what happens is all of the nobility in the main city of Goa, when Whenever they see a homeless man or anybody, they just basically just kick them out of the city into this garbage pile and then lock the doors behind them. Um, the gray terminal is just this this haze. You know, you just uh, when you're exiting the Midway Forest and you're looking down on it, it's just like scorched earth, just trash everywhere, scrap metal, rotten food, and a bunch of citizens that have been cast out of the Goa Kingdom proper have been living there, basically just scrounging on uh, like just rotten food, and they've sent up a little like shanty town there just living in the living in these little huts and these ramshackled old shacks they just take some rotting wood and some metal scraps and just put them together as best as they can to get some you know decent shelter to keep the rain off of their head which is probably acid rain if we're being honest here um and this is like the perfect example for like the world at large in fact dragon even said that dragon even talked about it as like a miniature blueprint for the entire world because here you have the nobles and it's like the nobles are looking out at their city and they're like how can we make our city perfect how can we make this city shining and glorious to anybody that comes he's like well how about we just take all the homeless people and shove them outside into the garbage dump so they can't make the city any dirtier anymore it's like oh yeah it's the perfect idea there's nothing morally wrong or questionable about that in fact, I have an idea. Let's form a royal guard unit whose sole job is to throw people out of the town. Um, the town itself is divided itself. There's Edgetown, which is the area that's the closest to the border wall. So there's like a giant wall. N not, not too much an attack on Titan territory here, but kind of. It's a big wall that separates the garbage dump from the actual city. There's Edgetown. Edgetown is sort of like the lower class of Goa. So basically, they're the ones waiting in line to get kicked out. Because Edgetown 
town is so close to the wall, you can still kind of smell the trash from there. So nobility obviously stays clear of it. And it's like you are just like one step shy of getting kicked out of the town into the Gray Terminal, which is, you know, it's it's still, I mean, Edgetown's not great, but, you know, the Gray Terminal is like you're literally living in trash and like excrement at that point. So, yeah, you're about to get kicked out. Then there's like the center of the town, which is like where most of the people live that can actually afford to live there. And then you got like the high town. You got the castle, of course. The castle has to be high above everybody so the nobles can look out and like spit on the commoners. Of course, this is One Piece. This is how it goes, right? Very classes system there. And as you can see here, the entire walled city kind of ends out at the shore. So it's like shaped like a sea. And the shore there is, of course, where the ports are and all the, you know, the uh, the, the ships that bring their weekly supply of caviar to the to the nobles and everything. And so that's, that's essentially the Goa kingdom there. So you got the castle where the king lives. By the way, we didn't really get to see the king. He's dead now. Uh, we got to see uh, Outlook the Third and Didit. Those are um, Sabo's biological parents, but they were just regular nobles. So pretty high up the chain, but not quite yet. We got to see some other nobles around there, like this guy and his daughter, which, okay, can we just address this? Like, I would not be surprised in the slightest, and this would fit a lot with, like, the themes of One Piece, but are the nobles in this place all, like, inbreeding? Because I'm not even saying that much about the little girl, but look at this. This aborted rat fetus is Mulesguard's father. This guy's a member of the Don Quixote family. Look at him. This is not- unless this guy ate the giant mutated rat zone, this dude is so inbred. Like, seriously. What do you have to do to get to this point? Like, my god, so, and it makes sense, I mean, I'm not trying to be disgusting, although I am, but it's like, you know how it goes with nobility, it's like we gotta keep our blood clean and pure, so we gotta marry into ourselves, alright? It, it would make sense that the Tenryubito and the nobles of One Piece, um, that, you know, they, they view the, um, the commoners as like a different species most of the time, it would make sense that they would never mingle in that way. And, you know, this also might just be because of Oda's art style. It might not go into, like, the inbreeding kind of respect. They might just be Oda trying to show how ugly they are on the inside by depicting that in their appearance on the outside. He's like, I'm going to draw these nobles in these messed up ways to show how ugly they are, both, like, figuratively and also, like, on the inside of just how they view the world. In fact, even more messed up, because the Tenryubito view themselves as so much more superior to even regular nobles, um, like, Mjolgar Mjoldsgard's father here, the aborted rat fetus, uh, he might be seen as, like, handsome to the other Tenryubito. Like, this is opulence. He's like, ah, he is so fat, he doesn't even, he can't even move anymore. So therefore, his servants have to do everything for him, even carry him around. That is true royalty right there. Why? You know? So, yeah. It, it might even be kind of something like that, where, you know, like, they would look at Mjolsgaard's father or the other nobles and view them as, like, very beautiful or handsome because of just the fact that's that's their culture, because the Tenryubito have such an insulated kind of culture in that regard, right? So, yeah, that's how it goes. Okay, so, um, the situation with Sabo, though, is that Sabo was born to Outlook and Didit and whatever, and they, you know, he didn't want to live there. He likened it to, like, a birdcage. In fact, when Sabo does go to uh, Dressrosa, I think that comparison is made again, because Doflamingo uses the birdcage. So, yeah, it's like a birdcage. It's so stifling, you know? It's the typical stuff, you know? His father wants him to grow up to be a noble and be just like him, and have a disdain for the peasants and all that stuff, and Sabo was like, no, I don't want to do that, and so he ran away to the Great Terminal, eventually ended up meeting Ace, and Ace and Sabo, they were the same age, they began to gain um, some finances, they began to, you know, beat up people and, you know, rob the nobles and stuff, and save up as much money as possible to eventually get a pirate ship and just get the hell out of here. Eventually, Luffy joins them, Luffy's a little bit younger than all of them, but, you know, they still kind of care for him as sort of like their little brother, you know, go Team ASL! American Sign Language? No. How are you? I don't, I don't, it's been a while since I did American Sign Language. It's been a long time. Um, but yeah, so that's what ASL stood for, is I just made the comparison there. But yeah, so they lived in, uh, you know, Mount Colbo with Dadan, who is one of the mountain bandits that lived up there. And they kind of, you know, she kind of raised them, but they spent most of their days just kind of playing out in the woods in the Midway Forest, fighting against giant animals, going to the Gray Terminal, looking around there. Uh, occasionally, they would even sneak into the town proper to kind of steal from people to save up for money. And that's what they did for a while. Eventually, this all came to a head, though 
though, when one of the Tenryubito, Saint Jalmak, was going to make a visit to the Goa Kingdom, okay? And so the nobles there in the Goa Kingdom were like, this is when we have to enact our plans. So I think they started to realize the problem with this. Uh, not the problem with taking all of their poorest citizens and throwing them into a literal garbage heap. There's no problem with that. No, the problem they started to realize is like, wait a second... We have a giant garbage heap on the outskirts of town. That might stink a little bit. If, if one whiff of the Grey Terminal enters Jalmak, I mean, Jalmak was wearing the protective dome anyway, but if, if it, that's, that's kind of unsightly. Like, we need to make that go away. And they're like, well, how do we do that exactly? Like, well, here's what we do. I think, one of the, I think this was their, their first plan, all right? The nobles, they get together in the castle. The king is there as well. They all get together at the castle, and they're like, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we got to figure out something to do about the literal giant garbage town happening outside of the gates. It's like, all right, here's what I think we do. I think we finally accept the commoners for who they really are. I think we accept them as human beings, the same as we all are, and open up the gates and all, you know, just give them baths. Let's all get the townspeople together, every noble, and let's give them sponge baths to clean them off, and let's give them a nice warm meal to eat and some clean water to drink and give them a nice little house to live in, you know, clean out some maybe like, 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 like a hostel kind of area, just a place for them to live currently. And uh, after everybody has been safely evacuated the Gray Terminal, uh, then we will work on uh, eliminating it in a very environmentally friendly manner. At this point, all of the nobles at the table were kind of looking at this guy like he, like he just uh, like lost his mind and started taking off all of his clothes and throwing his feces everywhere. They're looking at this guy like, R really, Saint Outlook? Or no, not Saint Outlook. It would just be like, really, Sir Outlook? And then Sir Outlook just looks at everybody and just. I'm kidding! Burn it all to the ground! Just torch it! And it's like, yeah, let's do that! You know, okay, so that's what they did. They sent a roving gang of, like, fire ar ar arsonist makers? I don't know what you want to call these guys. You know, they sent a bunch of people wearing gas masks into the freaking gray terminal, took out a bunch of freaking just, you know, napalm or whatever, just started torching everything in the entire place. Didn't matter if there was people living there, because they knew there were people living there. Of course they knew. They didn't care. It's like, we need to eliminate this as quickly as possible. Um, I kind of have a problem with this, because you ever smell burning garbage? Like, it's not an appealing smell. So, I don't know why they thought, like, bur and I think this happened, like, a day or two before Jalmak arrived. So, this was short-sighted in literally every context. You know, St. Jalmak arrives and he sees a giant black cloud of burning trash behind the freaking city and be like, what? You know, just like, you can't just get rid of this overnight. And I think that's what they tried to do, honestly. Um, but yeah, now, thankfully... Thankfully, Dragon was there to save a lot of the members of Grey Terminal. He couldn't save everybody, a lot of people died. But he saved Sabo, and he saved a lot of other members that I'm sure at that point, like, that was a free ticket to the Revolutionary Army. Dragon's there, and he's like, Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, do you hate what they uh, just did to you? Uh, not only just kicking you out of the town, but also burning down the one place that you could call home, which was, as I remind you, a giant trash pile. Come and join the Revolutionary Army! We have cupcakes! And they're like, screw this! We're joining the Revolutionary Army! Like, I'm sure they got, like, hundreds of supporters that day alone. Man, yeah, they didn't even care. They even hired the Blue Jam Pirates to help them out with that plan, and then they just torched the Blue Jam Pirates as well. So Luffy and Ace and Dadan, they managed to barely get out of that alive. You know, so yeah, yeah, that was a stupid move right there. And the most disgusting thing about this whole thing is they never learned a lesson because it was stated at the kind of the end of the um at the end of the flashback, you know, Luffy and Ace and everything, that the gray terminal eventually just got built back up again. So that's like their plan to solve the issue. It's just like, yeah, every few decades, whenever the trash pile gets too big, you know, it gets to the point where you can start to see it over the wall of the town. We send in a bunch of crazy arsonists to burn the place to the ground, and then we just start all over from there. So, my God. <laughs>
Man, it's such a bad idea to burn it. I mean, not just for the fact that there's, like, people living there, but also, like, can you imagine all the toxic fumes that would be coming out of that? Like, everybody in the, um, everybody in the town would be, like, suffocating from all the fumes. It's just, like, it's not a good idea no matter what. But also, yeah, people living there, kind of a messed up thing. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's the Goa Kingdom, though, laid out for you. You got the main, main town, you got the Grey Terminal, Midway Forest, Mount Colbo, and then finally, way off to the side, away from all the disgusting nobles and the, and the giant trash pile is where Luffy grew up with Mayor Woodslap. All right, thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you're I uh, hope you're we're holding onto your pipe the entire time. I wasn't, but I'm okay because it's my video. I can I have the privilege to you know not hold onto my pipe, but you had to the entire time. All right. Well, anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. Teching signing out. Oh, by the way, there's also a space program on the other side of the Fusha Village. Like, like Fusha Village is right here. Goa Kingdom's over here. If you just walk like 10 miles to the left, there's also a really advanced uh, uh, space program. So, But Oda's never revealed that yet, but I'm revealing that now. So we're going to find that out later soon. Okay, see you everybody. Signing out.